Well, today, as I say in a moment ago, our worship set just flowed so well with, with our passage of Scripture. We are back in the Gospel of John this morning. I don't know about you, I missed, I missed John. It's like a good friend that you haven't seen for, for a couple months. We took a break for, for our Advent season, our Advent holiday, and for our, our kickoff of the new year, um, our little mini-sermon series, uh, just wanting to, to let the, the Lord guide us and renew us as we head into 2024. But we are back in the Gospel of John this morning. If you're new to Hope Chapel, we love expository preaching. We believe that God's Word is meant to be understood as it was originally written. That we want to understand God's word as, as, those, as those, those original disciples of Jesus would have understood it as they read the gospel of John, as they, as they listened to Jesus' teaching. So, so we've been taking the gospel of John, and, and really since a year ago, we started this almost a year ago to the day, back in, back in the beginning of February 2022, we started the gospel of John, and we've just been walking through it passage by passage. And today we're going to be in John chapter 14. Before we get there, though, I, I just have a question for you related to today's passage of scripture. Where is, or what is, the nicest place that you've ever stayed? What's the nicest place you've ever stayed? Maybe, maybe picture it in your head. Maybe it was a vacation house or hotel or resort that you stayed at. Maybe it was like a friend's house that you visited. Maybe it, maybe it was one of your own, like your own house. Maybe it was your house as a kid. I would say there's a couple places that come to mind. I still remember a vacation that I took way back in 2000, I think it was 2011. My my grandmother had recently passed away, and our whole family went down to Arkansas. And we stayed at this, this vacation rental house, and it was beautiful. It had like this... Sometimes your mind plays tricks on you, but I remember the deck on the back of this house being like 60 foot long. It was like the whole length of the house. It looked out over the, these mountains. They're more like, they're in Missouri, so they're more, or Arkansas. They're more like hills compared to what we have out here in Arizona. But it's this beautiful view. It was this gorgeous house. So nice, so nice. The reason why I'm talking about maybe the, the nicest place you've ever stayed is, is I, was tempted, I was tempted to title my sermon today Jesus is the best travel agent. <laughs> but that wasn't a scripture. So I decided I, I would just stick with Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and you might be a little confused, but as soon as I start reading today's passage of scripture, I think you'll get it. I think you'll understand. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And, and, uh, and while you're turning there, let me just give a little context for this passage of scripture. If you weren't with us as we've been walking through the gospel of John up to this point, we are at the point in the gospel of John where Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room, that he has had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem the week before his Passion Week, the week before his last week here on on earth, that he has entered Jerusalem with crowds waving palm branches, shouting Hosanna to the son of David, he has had that, this week where he has ministered in the temple. The people have been looking for, for a military Messiah. Uh, but Jesus, he's been, he's been explaining to his disciples who he really came to be. That he didn't come to overthrow Rome. He came to, to really save us, to be a servant. That he has washed his disciples' feet. You know, he has modeled for them servant leadership. And he has started to, to let them know and prophesy and proclaim to them that, that he's going to die on the cross that he won't be with them for very much longer. In our our last passage of scripture, he told the disciples, I'm going to be leaving you soon, and where I'm going, you won't be able to follow. And that's where we pick up today's passage of scripture in John chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, let's just pray over God's word, and then we're going to read the first 11 verses together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning asking, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through the preaching of your word. That these, this would not just be the, the thoughts or opinions of a preacher, but it would be the living word of God spoken, illuminated by the Holy Spirit to our hearts. That it would penetrate deep into our lives to divide between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. That it would judge our thoughts and our attitudes. That your word would make us more like you, Jesus. Accomplish the work that you want to accomplish through the preaching of your word this morning. Jesus, it's in your mighty name that we pray. Amen. John chapter 14, starting in verse 1, says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that you, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. I want to take a few minutes this morning and just walk through this passage of Scripture with you. As I said a moment ago, Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going away and where he's going they cannot follow. He's told them that basically he's prophesied his, his death, his, his coming death on the cross. And so Jesus, he opens up by, by telling them, let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus is comforting the disciples because they're worried. They're, they don't know what's going on. Their, their rabbi is telling them that he's going to be going away. It, to me, it's a little interesting when you think about it. Jesus comforting the disciples. Jesus comforting the disciples because think about the situation. Jesus is about to be betrayed, be denied, and be abandoned by one or all of the disciples. He is about to be tortured literally to death, to be flogged, to be crucified, to be humiliated, to suffer and die. And Jesus knows this is coming. And Jesus has phrased it in probably like the least dramatic way possible. Well, I'm going to be going where you can't follow. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be tortured to death, and, and, and you're not going to be able to follow at this point. And so his disciples are a little worried because they're confused. They don't understand what Jesus is talking about. I don't know about you, but in that situation, a little bit of confusion, pending being tortured to death. Who, who deserves the comfort more? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it just speaks to Jesus and his love for his disciples that, that he is comforting them. And I would say to you this morning, church, Jesus, he is the God of all comfort. That you might be facing situations in your life where, where you just need to hear those words of Jesus. Let not your hearts be troubled. You might be facing situations in your life. Maybe, maybe you're facing an illness, a medical condition where you don't know, you don't know how much longer you or a loved one has. You might be facing a, a situation in life where, where maybe it's a job situation where you don't know how you're going to make ends meet or, or, or where, where a job or where the next paycheck's going to come from. You might be facing a situation where you're in a relationship and this relationship is, is one that's essential. Maybe it's a, a parent, child, a, a marriage, and you're not sure how it's going to survive. You might be facing all sorts of situations where you don't know the future. You don't know how things are going to turn out. You don't know how you're going to make it. And Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. We don't know the future, but we know who holds the future in his hands. Jesus says, if you would just believe. I would point out that word there for believe. It's, it's, it's a good word. It's, it's probably the best translation in English. But it's really because in English, we don't, we don't have certain words. I love the English language. It's the only language that I really know how to speak very well, you know. But there's, there's certain things that you can't say in English like you can say in other languages. So the word there for believe, it, the word uh, uh, pistuete, it really is the verb form of the word faith. And in English, we don't have, we don't have a verb form for faith. It's a noun in English, and it's, it's this idea of, of trust and belief. But what Jesus is calling the disciples to do is to have faith. Put your faith, put your trust and belief in God. 
Don't put your trust and belief in yourself. When it comes to your future, the fact that you don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know what your future holds, that if I go away, you don't know how you're going to make it, don't worry about that. Have faith. Have trust. Have belief. The, the verb, you know, faith it, if you will. Put your faith in Jesus. Faith it. Put your faith in God. Put your faith in me. This is one of the most significant times where Jesus really is equating himself with the Father. That if you believe in the Father, if you believe also in me, if you have faith, you don't need to let your hearts be troubled. If you have faith in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, He, the triune God, holds the future in His hands so you can have comfort. You can trust. You can have faith. You can believe and know that things are going to be okay. How do we know this? Jesus says, in my Father's house where He's going, there are many rooms If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. I love it how we sang in worship today about heaven. Sometimes sometimes we can forget that heaven is a source of comfort. Heaven, God's kingdom, is a source of comfort. I remember when I was a kid, actually more, more, more so when I was a teenager versus when I was in kids' church myself, because when I was a teenager, I helped out in kids' church. And there was a song that got popular when I was, when I was in that you know, middle school, high school age that, man, I just loved it. I loved it. it had, I still think it had one of the best like, guitar riffs of all time. You, you might know it. It was the song Big House. da na 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 da na na da na na you, you, guys, you guys know what? Come. But I, I actually, when I sing it, I can't help but do the motions to it because I did the motions so often when I was a kid where it was like, come and go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. A big, big table with lots and lots of food. A big, big yard. And this is my favorite part, where we can play football. And then some people would throw the ball. Others would like dive for the touchdown. <laughs> There'd be like kids on the floor everywhere. It was, it was just a blast. I loved singing that song in kids' church. It was so fun. Heaven is a cause for celebration. It is a cause for our hearts to not be troubled. It is a cause for us to be able to have faith and trust in God. Because no matter how broken, no matter how hurtful, no matter how bad things get in this life, we have an eternity where things are as they should be. That on the scales of of how good or how bad life is, like, like a temporary portion of of things being a little bit rough, but hey, there's also still good stuff in this life, that doesn't weigh anything compared to eternity in God's kingdom. That doesn't compare anything. And and just think about for a second how how good heaven is, right? Like we talked about, like picture, you know, the best place that you've ever stayed, right? Best place. Maybe maybe for you it was the best place because there uh, there was roller coasters there. Maybe if, if it was my wife, it'd be the best place because it was just like designed so nice and pretty into a T, right? For, for my wife, she went to, she went to, to um, Waco a few years back with some friends and they, they stayed at Magnolia Farms. I'll just be real with you. Joanna Gaines has nothing on Jesus, <laughs> right? Like Joanna Gaines might prepare a place, you know, that, that hotel in Waco for you to stay. And it, it might be beautiful. It might be really pretty. And guys, sorry, if you don't know who Joanna Gaines is, uh, just ask a lady. I'm sure she'll be able to tell you. <laughs> it might be beautiful, but it does not compare to the room, the place that Jesus has prepared for you. Amen. Where Jesus has prepared a place for you. The God of the universe who loves you, who knows you, he has prepared a place for you in his kingdom. And you know what? It's not even just the the room, how nice it is. It is the fact that we are with our God and Savior. We are living in community, in relationship with the one who created us. That we get to live in perfect love, in perfect relationship with him. 
we can have comfort in knowing that that is our destination. That's where we're going. It is, it is, our, it is our hope that Jesus has went to prepare a place for us, and he is coming back to take us to be with him. So whether it's, it's at our passing here on earth, when we die to go be, to be with the Lord, or when Jesus comes back to earth to take all of his followers to be with him, we have a hope. We have a blessed hope that Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him. Jesus is coming back to heal every disease and sickness and injury. My nephew just had open heart surgery on Friday. There is no need for, for surgery in heaven. There's no heart conditions or knee replacements or, 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 or pain or, or joy. There, none of that. In heaven, there is no disease or sickness. In heaven, there is no brokenness. Those, the, that, that broken plumbing at your house, you don't have to worry about it in heaven. My family and I, we have been without a dishwasher since October. It has been a little bit of a pain for us. <laughs> Eight times the dishwasher repairman has been to our house. There is no broken dishwashers in heaven. Right? Jesus will fix everything. Like in heaven, we don't have to worry about the pain and the hurt and the frustration and the annoyances that we struggle with here on earth. Jesus is coming back to set to right. Not just, not just the, the, the petty things, not just the, the comfort things. Man, he's come to set to right the, the sin and the evil, the hurt that we've experienced to mend our hearts and our souls where we've been wounded. The relationships that seem damaged beyond repair, he can repair and reconcile even those. Jesus is coming back to set things right, to bring his heaven down to earth. I love it, John, we're, we're reading the gospel of John. John gets the, revel, the, uh, the revelation from God in the book of Revelation, where he sees heaven coming down to earth, heaven meeting us. Jesus is coming back. And eventually, we're not going to get into all the eschatology right now, but eventually he's going to bring heaven with him as well. That's our hope. After bringing that comfort to the disciples, after letting them know, don't be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back. Jesus adds this line that I think is just, it's just kind of funny to me. He comforts them because they're confused, and then immediately he confuses them again. And you know the way to where I am going, verse 4. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Sometimes I feel for Thomas. <laughs> you know that he's, he had some good things to say at some point in his relationship with Jesus. We actually looked at one of them before, you know, where he's like, let's go and die with Jesus. But he, he misunderstands what Jesus is talking about at that moment. But like Thomas' words in, to Jesus in the gospel, they're like always like, like it's, he's either doubting, like unless I place my hands, you know, in his wounds, I'm not going to believe. Or, 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 or like right here, like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Like he doesn't get very, you know, the, the lines that are recorded in the gospel of John are not very flattering to Thomas. I'm, I'm sure that he had some smart things to say at some point. But he, he says to Jesus, in some ways it's logical, like, like what do you mean we know the way? You've, you've said that where you're going, you're leaving us, and where, where you're going, we can't follow. But you haven't told us where you're going yet. You know, how, how do we know the way if we don't know the destination? I think what, really what Jesus is doing, he is pointing out knowledge that the disciples had that they didn't realize they had. I think if the disciples, if Thomas thought about it for a second, he would realize that Jesus is talking about going to the Father. He, he said that, you know, even right there. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. He's going to the father. He's going to the father's house. He's going to the father's kingdom. And he says, you know the way. I think if, if Thomas thought about it for just a second, Jesus has been them, with them for, for minimum, you know, three and a half years at this point. Where did Thomas think Jesus had been giving them directions to that whole time? Jesus had been teaching them. He'd been showing them how to live. He'd been telling them. He'd been giving them directions for their lives. Where were those directions to? It wasn't, I don't know, Sesame Street. 
Can you tell me how to get? I have different songs, childhood songs are in my head today. I don't know why. <laughs> Jesus wasn't giving Thomas directions to an earthly location. Jesus had been teaching them how to live. Jesus had been teaching them the way to heaven. And so that's Jesus' response in verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I loved singing that this morning. You are the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the way. Thomas Akempis, a, a, a medieval um, just monk, scholar, devotional theologian. I love the way what he wrote on this saying of Jesus, where he writes in the, the voice of Jesus. He says, follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way which you must follow, the truth which you must believe, the life which, for which you must hope. I am the inviolable way, the infallible truth, the unending life. I am the way that is straight, the supreme life, the life that is true, the blessed, uncreated life. If you abide in my way, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, and you shall attain life everlasting. Jesus is the way to salvation. He is the way. Jesus came. He paved a path. He built a bridge to the Father where there hadn't been one before. By his life, sinless life, and sacrificial death on the cross, he made payment for the sins of humanity that is fully God and fully man. He paid the penalty for our sins to give us a sacrifice worthy to be accepted by the Father so that we could be forgiven, that we could have a way into heaven. By his death on the cross, he defeated sin, death, and the devil. He defeated our brokenness. He healed our sinful condition by his blood shed on the cross. That he made a way to salvation where there hadn't been a way before. Jesus is the truth. The aletheia in Greek, the reality of God. Jesus revealed to humanity who God is. Jesus, God the Son, took on human flesh so we could know the truth the reality of who God is, the reality of, of who God wants us to be, of what a godly life looks like. He revealed that in Christ we have the truth about God, the truth about ourselves. And last but certainly not least, in Christ is life. In Christ is, is like, like I said, what a godly life looks like. In Christ is the power to live an abundant life, a life by God's design, a life that is of a different quality than just our, our, what we would live according to our sinful nature. A life that is in God's image. And that quality of life is not just holy, not just pure, not just abundant. It's everlasting. It's life in his kingdom. Life that stretches both from here to eternity with God in heaven. Jesus is that way, that truth, that kind of life. And no one comes to the Father except by him. It's interesting to note that in today's modern world, that statement of Jesus, that statement of, of incredible hope and comfort can also sometimes be ridiculed, can sometimes be a, a reason why people think that, that Jesus is, is a bigot, is judgmental because Jesus also says no one comes to the Father except through him. That there's, there's the thought in our modern world, well, well you know, Jesus, he's, he's a good teacher, but this exclusivity that Jesus claims, ah, I don't know if I buy into that. That's the thought of many in this world. That they would maybe argue that aren't all religions an equally valid way to God, just different paths to the same destination? I think there are two reasons I just wanted to quickly address why I think this, this accusation against Jesus is, is wrong. The first is that when you look at the different paths, the different ways, if you will, the different religions, they're logically incompatible. 
that when Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life, you know, there are, th- there are times where you might, hey, in, in, a, in a physical world, like, hey, you can have different destinations, different routes that will lead to the same path. But if you look at the, the religions of the world, the, the end destination is not the same. It's just not. You know, that if you, if, you were, if you were an atheist, well, the end destination is simply you die and that's it. If you're, if you're a Hindu, the end destination is to say, hey, we want to escape this endless cycle of reincarnations. And we just want to, to realize that, that our individuality is not real. It's an illusion and that we're part of the universal soul of Brahman, you know. In Christianity, our individual self is a soul that lasts for eternity in relationship distinct from God. That we get to be one with God, but not the same as. We get to be one in relationship, in unity with God, but our, our self is still the same. You know, you may say, well, well doesn't Islam teach heaven? It's a, different, it's a different place. You know, heaven and Christianity, there, there's not 72, you know, uh, maidens waiting for each of us <laughs> in, in the heaven that, that the Bible describes. It's a, the different religions, it's, it's a different destination. It's a different path. It's a different truth. The teachings of, of Jesus, the teachings of Christianity about the life of Jesus are markedly different than any other. Are there similarities? For sure. I think in God's word, it tells us, right, that even Gentiles, even non-Christians, non-people who don't have the revelation of God in the Bible, God's created each of us with an innate sense of knowing what's right and what's wrong. And so there are elements of the truth found in, in, in every religion. And that God wants us as Christians to be like Paul, to maybe, to maybe as, as Paul preached to the, to the Athenians and said, hey, what you worship as something unknown, let me proclaim to you that we can find those similarities and say, hey, this points to Jesus. But Jesus is uniquely the truth in a way that no other religion has access to the truth. Because Jesus is God who took on human flesh, who lived among us, who revealed to us the nature of God, the truth about God's will for our lives without any intermediaries. No, there had no prophet to, to give the message. It was God himself coming to earth to reveal his nature, to reveal his truth, to reveal who he is. That Jesus is uniquely the way to God. Jesus is uniquely the truth. Jesus is uniquely the power for an eternal life, an abundant life, a heavenly life in a way that, that nothing else gives access. And that brings me to my second point, why this argument against Jesus isn't valid. Jesus didn't arrogantly come to say, hey, all you other paths are wrong. Jesus came because there was no path. Jesus came because all of humanity stood condemned. Because each and every one of us, each and every one of us separate ourselves from God by our sins. Each and every one of us are not worthy of God's kingdom. So there was no way. There was none. It wasn't that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm dog. No, there was no way. And so God, it's like, it's like there was no way to God. Jesus built a bridge over an infinite chasm that we couldn't cross. And then it's like people are like, well, I, I, don't, I don't like that bridge. <laughs> Don't, don't get so caught up because there's only one bridge that you walk off a cliff. That there is a bridge to God where there wasn't one before. Jesus created it. His death on the cross created a bridge where there was no way before. And it's available to everyone. Every nation, tribe, and tongue, every person, ethnicity, nobody is excluded from taking the path that Jesus has created, the way to the Father. Jesus just says, you got to come to me. You got to come to me, and I will show you the Father. I will take you to the Father. Here is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus came to give words of comfort. Jesus came to help. Jesus came to save. At this point, after declaring himself to be the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus again points out, a truth that the disciples had access to but weren't aware of in verses 7 through 10, where Jesus says, after saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? 
Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I, have, that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. I think what Jesus is saying here is that he has been revealing the Father to the disciples this whole time. That they know, they know the Father if they know Jesus. John, in the first, in the opening chapter of the, uh, of the book of John that we preached through, you know, a, a year ago, he kind of summarizes the, the message of, of the gospel in that opening prologue. I love what, what John says in, in John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Previously, the invisible God, the God that, that humanity only knew through the revelation of prophets, the God whom humanity only knew through, through looking at God's creation, God became visible in the person of Jesus Christ. He stepped into our world. Jesus revealed God in a way that we didn't have access to him before. And so Jesus... His actions were God's actions. As, as Jesus said here in John 14, Jesus said earlier also in John 5, 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on, of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus' actions reveal the actions of God. God is a God who wants to heal and save, fix what is broken. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus' words were the words of God. As, as Jesus just said in, in John 14, he said earlier in John chapter 12, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a can commandment, what to say and what to speak. Jesus' teachings were not just his own words. They were the words the Father had given him to teach, the truths the Father had given him to reveal. That in Jesus we have knowledge of who God is, what a godly life looks like, what God's actions are, what God's words are, we have access to in Jesus. Jesus closes this passage of scripture in John 14, verse 11. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. That's a theme that if you've been with us, you know has been repeated over and over again in the Gospel of John, that the disciples can believe, the disciples can have faith and trust in Jesus because he didn't come just to, just to teach and model, but he came to give signs, to, to instill faith through the miracles that God the Father performed in him, the works that Jesus came to do, that if the Father was not at work in Jesus, he wouldn't be able to transform water into wine. He wouldn't be able to take five loaves and two fish and multiply it to feed thousands. He wouldn't be able to, to tell a blind man to see, a lame man to walk. He wouldn't be able to call Lazarus, who'd been dead and in the tomb four days, to come forth and walk out of the grave. It is only by the power of God at work in Jesus, the God the Father demonstrating that Jesus is God the Son, that Jesus could do the things, the works that he did. So Jesus said, you can know, you can have faith, you can trust and believe in the works that I have done and the words that I have said, the teachings that I have given, that they are from the Father because of the demonstration the Father has given to prove my ministry is from him. This is a powerful passage of scripture. So what do we take from it? How do we take this passage of Scripture and apply it to our lives this morning? I would just say there's two, two big truths that, that stick out to me. The first is that as Christians, we need to remember that our faith overcomes our fear. Our faith overcomes our fear for the future. That we don't need to let our hearts be troubled or to be anxious about anything. Because Jesus has already overcome. There's a, a quote about worry. Sometimes it's attributed to George Washington. I think it's really just from the internet. But it says, it says, Worry is interest paid in advance 
on a debt that may never come due. So many people live in worry, live in anxiety, live in stress about the future, about the bad that could happen when we don't have to. There might be struggles. In fact, there will be troubles in this life. But we know the end of the story. We know. We know that in the end, it's all good. God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. We know that Christ has already won. We don't need to worry about the future. There's, there's two songs that I was, as I was preparing this sermon that popped into my mind as I, as I got on this point. One, one Christian, the other not so much. The first is that, that song. Again, lots of songs today. Don't worry, be happy. Some of you guys, that, that little reggae tune is already playing in your head. Do you know, do you know that song? <laughs> Sorry, whistling. I, I thought that song was, was by Bob Marley. Do you guys know that it wasn't by Bob Marley? I, I didn't realize that. But the lyrics to that song, now listen to what I said. In your life, expect some trouble. But when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Be happy now. You know, that song is, is true for Christians. It's not actually very logical if you don't know the end. That it's not a, it's not a logical song to be able to sing. If you, know, if you believe that this world is all there is, if, if you don't believe that, that God is there for you working all things together for, for his plan, that even if we struggle in this life, even, even in this life, we ultimately, you know, the worst happens and we die. We don't need to worry because we know God holds us in his hands. We can be happy because we know the end. You can only really have that peace of mind when you know Christ has you. Jesus holds you in his hand. That, that the song I actually like better is, is one that we, we sang today. As I said before, our, our worship set just flowed all, all about this passage of scripture. But we sang the song you've already won by Shane and Shane. There's peace that outlasts darkness, hope that's in the blood, future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow for tomorrow's in your hands. It's going, skipping ahead, just like you always have, I know how the story ends. We will be with you. You're my savior, no, my defense. No more fear in life or death. I know how the story ends. We know the end destination. We know Christ has told us, in my Father's house there are many rooms. My Father's house, it's a big house. It's a nice place, nicer than any place you've ever visited. And God's there. He has prepared a place specifically for you. He has your name written in the reservation book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. He has prepared a place for you. You don't need to worry about what comes in this life. He has made a way. So, so don't worry. Don't stress. I'd liken it to, you know, uh, like that quote before, sometimes, sometimes we worry about the future. If we worry about things that might happen, you can spend a lot of time making yourself miserable for a bad thing that never happens. On the flip side, you can get a lot of enjoyment out of a good thing before it comes. Have you guys ever taken a vacation that you just knew was going to be a good vacation? And so you just like look forward to it? That you can have this like pre-vacation mode of like, oh man, we're going to, I don't know, you can pick your place of your favorite vacation place. Mine might be like a cruise. You might be Disney World, Disneyland, I would meet Universal Studios, whatever it is. Maybe, maybe it's Arkansas, you know. There's actually a nice place, Branson, that's by there. That, that might be a good vacation spot for some of you. But you enjoy looking forward to that vacation. As Christians, it's not a vacation, but it is a trip. We get to go home. We're strangers on this earth. We're sojourners in a land that's not our own. We get to go home to the place Jesus has prepared for us in our Father's house, the room that has our name on it. We can start enjoying that truth, finding comfort and peace in that fact. Jesus has already won. He's already made a way. 
He has prepared a place for us, and he is coming back so that we also may be where he is. So let's start looking forward to it. Let's, let's start packing and preparing now. Let's start preparing now. What, is that, what does that look like? What does it look like to go and look forward to Jesus coming now? Well, church, I would, I would submit to you that really it all stems back to what Jesus said in verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That our, our side, our application, is to first recognize that Jesus is the way. He is the way. He has shown us the way to the Father. That if you read the teachings of Jesus, if you, re- re- if you read what the disciples have passed on to us, that we're, when Jesus told the disciples, you know the way. We know what the disciples knew because we have the words of Jesus. We have the teachings of the disciples in God's word. What is that way? The Bible tells us it's, it's simple. It's not easy. It'll cost you everything that you have. But the way to the Father is simply to confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. To confess that we are sinners in need of a Savior, that, that we have messed up, we have created a, a separation between us and God by the sins, the mistakes, the evil deeds that we've done. And that we can't get there on our own. But that Jesus made a way for us That if we confess that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth, who died on a cross for our sins, we can be forgiven. Our sinfulness can be healed. We can be made right with God. We can be cleansed so that we can walk that path into the Father's presence in whose presence there can be no sin because we have been washed by the blood of Jesus. That when we accept Jesus, when we accept that, that he is the truth and he is the life, the Holy Spirit gives us new life in Christ. It's not that we won't struggle with our sinful nature ever again, but that the Holy Spirit enables us to walk by the power of the Spirit in the life that God has for us, that we can live out that new life, that different quality of life, that abundant life, that eternal life, that God has given us, that the Father has given us through Christ the Son. So this morning, in a moment, I want to invite, if there's anyone who's never given their life to Jesus, I want to give you that chance. For those of us who've already given our life to Jesus, that we've started on that way, I think the next step is to just to walk in the truth and life of Christ. To recognize that Jesus has revealed the truth about who God is and God's will for our lives, that we need to know the truth of Jesus. We need to get into his word so we can know the truth of of who we are in Christ, of who God created us to be. That when we know that truth, we get to live the life that Jesus has for us. We get to live like Christ in character. We get to live like Christ in, 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 in our purity. We get to live like Christ in our love for others. We get to imitate Jesus and become more like him. That when we follow the way, the truth, and the life of Christ, we'll still face troubles in this life. But we don't need to fear. We don't need to be troubled because we know that Jesus' way, Jesus' truth, and Jesus' life will help us overcome whatever troubles life throws our way. So church, would you stand with me this morning? In a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to sing one last song of worship. In a moment, I want to give an opportunity. If you'd like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray with you. In a moment, if you've already given your life to Jesus, we're going to pray during this last song. These altars are open. We're going to have our elders come. We're going to have other prayer partners come. And if you need prayer for anything this morning, if there are things that you are facing in this life, if there are troubles that you have, if your heart is troubled and you just need Jesus to say to you, do not let your hearts be troubled. 
I know how the story ends. I have prepared a place for you. I have a plan and purpose for you in this life, on this side of heaven as well. If you need prayer so that your hearts, you might give those, cast your cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. We want to pray for you as well. As we prepare to pray, as we, as we bow our heads, as we close our eyes, I just want to ask if that first prayer is you this morning, if, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never accepted that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by him, and you'd like to give your life to Jesus this morning, would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray with you here in just a moment. The altars will also be open that if you want to come and receive prayer at the altar, you'll be invited to do that as well. Church, would you just pray with me this morning? Maybe as I pray, would you just, would you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Jesus, would you help me live for you? as my Lord and Savior. Help me to follow your way, your truth, and your life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I would just invite you. We would love to talk with you this morning. We would love to pray with you this morning. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one this morning and just walk with you on what it means to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But church, as I pray over you this morning, if you, that second altar invitation, if that's you, I invite you. These altars will be open as we worship the Lord together in one final song, or you can make your seat an altar. But I want you to know that if you are facing troubles in this life, Jesus wants to be there for you. He wants to tell you, don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus, I just pray this morning over anyone who is facing a trouble this morning, anyone who is facing anxiety, anyone who is facing fear over the future because they don't know how they're going to get from where they are now to where things are, are headed in the future, the path that you have for them. I pray, Lord, this morning that they would be able to have peace in Jesus' name, that you would calm anxiety in their hearts, that they would know that the ultimate end destination is already settled. There is joy, there is peace, there is abundance in your kingdom. And that we know that not only do you own the ultimate future in your hands, not only do you know that you've already prepared a place for them in heaven, But you know the plans that you have for them in this life. That you can provide, you can guide, you can lead. You will work all things together for the good of those who love you, who have been called according to your purpose. So this morning, I, I just pray, Lord, that we would be able to cast our anxieties, to cast our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.